Good evening. We're ready for chapter 22 in the book of Acts. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Father, we thank you for your holy word. And even in these uncertain times, we know our, our obligation to commune with you one-to-one -one in the study of your word. Help us to grow. Help us to mature. Equip us to serve you, to live as your ministers in this world. Be with our nation, we pray. In time of fear, hatred, times of danger, draw us to you as a nation. Let not evil win. Lord, as we consider that part of the prayer that you not allow evil to win, we pray that you would teach us our sin, that we might repent of it. Lord, we know that all sin can fall short of your glory. Let us never be so sure of our own righteousness. that we endanger our testimony or even our walk with you through arrogance and a refusal to repent. But teach us, guide us, show us the way. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul's been arrested in the temple and almost beaten will beat but almost killed the Romans ran to his aid we spoke of this in chapter 21 and he raised his hand last week and asked and spoke to the people that's where we stopped this is where we begin this is a traditional response remember in this world women didn't matter they didn't count. In the Roman world, they were property. In the Jewish world, they were less. Brethren and fathers, those who are his brothers, those who are his elders, hear my defense before you now. The word in the Greek is apologia. Today, we've turned that word into a confession or an and admitted some sin or error. But back then it meant a verbal defense. I'm going to defend my position to you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more quiet. They were convinced that he was not a Jew. Here he is in the temple. That he was disrespecting Judaism. They're going to continue to believe that, but for a moment when they hear him speaking in Hebrew, they're giving him a little bit of the benefit of doubt. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew. I'm not a Gentile. Born in Tarsus of Cilicia. That was a free Roman city. Uh, one of Julius Caesar's fam favorite teachers friends was from that city and so Julius Caesar gave the city a gift. He made them free. They didn't have to pay well they called it taxes but you could call it also tribute. They didn't have to pay that to the Roman Empire. But you weren't automatically a Roman citizen by being born there so most scholars believe that means that Paul's father somebody special, maybe a soldier who had served uh, 
long enough within the Roman army to have earned citizenship. However it happened, Paul was born a citizen, a Roman citizen of the city of Tarsus. I was born there, verse 3 says, but brought up probably after he um, reached the age of 12 and was considered a man, brought up in this city, in Jerusalem, at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the greatest rabbi of that day, who had himself been taught by Hillel, who was even greater. And we know that Paul, we've read in, um, in Acts and earlier verses, was being groomed to be the next great rabbi. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law. I was a Pharisee's Pharisee and was zealous towards God as you all are today. I obeyed every single law. I persecuted this way. Remember the way was what they called Christianity before they called it Christianity. I persecuted that. We remember that from earlier verse, earlier chapters. Persecuted it to the death. Binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. He's doing this to say how to show how diligent and devoted a Jew he has been. As also the high priest bears me witness. Now, more than likely, this means Paul was demonstrating or producing the letters of authority he had. As also the high priest bears me witness, and all the council of the elders, the Sanhedrin from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Now, everyone there, he took them, sent them to Jerusalem to be punished. Paul stressing just how faithful a Jew he has been, how observant how nitpicking, how he, oh, he is a Jew's Jew. Verse 6, Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus. We know this story, but now we're hearing it from, from, Paul, from Paul, not as a historical uh, event, but as a seal of approval, God's seal of approval over his ministry. It happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon. Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered and said, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. The very man whom these believers had been following and Paul was imprisoning and worse now is face to face with Paul what a change he has seen Jesus now this by the way makes him an apostle an apostle by definition was an eyewitness Jesus Christ. Disciples follow Jesus. We Christians today are all disciples of Jesus. But an apostle is an eyewitness. Paul is, is equal to Peter and John and James, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, because he's an eyewitness. Notice that Jesus says, I am Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. We're pers when Paul was harming Jesus' followers, he was harming Jesus. We're not in this alone. Jesus weeps with us and suffers with us. He died for us on the cross and he continues to walk with us. He is our intercessor. He stands between God and us pleading on our behalf. 
He suffers with us. He carries our load. We're never alone. And those who were with me indeed saw the light, so I have witnesses that the light is true. And they were afraid. Wherever the light was, it, it, it scared them. But they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. They didn't hear the words. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go to Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. Paul has been anti-Christian. But notice he says, What am I to do? What shall I do, Lord? The word Lord, today we just use it as a name for Jesus too often. But it literally means our Master, our God. At this very second, Paul has done a 180. Seeing Jesus face to face, I often think that maybe Paul had felt guilty about persecuting Christians and maybe the reason he was so hard on them is because he had been dealing with uh, questions, doubts about maybe whether, whether Jesus is gospel was true. Whatever the reason, he turns around immediately to see Jesus. And now Jesus is his God, is his Lord. And Jesus tells him, Arise and go to Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. Just like Abraham was told by God, Go to a place that I will show you. Jesus tells Damascus, tells um, Paul, in Damascus, I've got things for you that I'm not ready to tell you about yet. Faith demands that. God doesn't tell us everything he's going to do in our life. We want that, but he doesn't. He never does it. Instead, God shines, as we cross a river, God shines enough light to see the next stone. And that's all he gives us. And if in faith we walk to that stone, he shines enough light for us to see the next stone. Faith is always a faithful event by faithful event. We want to see the entire picture. And God says you can't handle the entire picture. You wouldn't understand. And quite frankly, you're going to mature as you make this journey. And the person you are at the end of it, the grown-up you'll be at the end of it, is not the same as the child you are now. How do you tell a child what his life is going to look like when he's grown? Well, we try. But no one can know except the adult by looking backwards. Looking forward, we never see. We can never understand. I think many of us, if we saw what God had in mind for us, we'd run away in fear. Jesus says, just go. Just trust me and go to the Masters. Verse 11. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, the word glory in the Greek is the word light. So the light of that light, the intensity of that light, the brightness of that light. Being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Not only did Paul not know what was going to happen when he got there, he was blind. What a great metaphor for us. God leads us, we can't even see the way. We're blind until he opens our eyes. This is Christian life. People think a good Christian is supposed to be in complete control of his spiritual life, to know everything, and that's not the way it works. God says, walk with me. You're not ready to know where I'm going, but I promise when you get there, you'll have more wisdom. 
to be more like Jesus once we get there. Our job is to be faithful. Abraham did it. When he went where God came, he went to a place that God said, I will tell you on the way. I'm not going to tell you where you're going. As he traveled from Mesopotamia, the Iran-Iraq area, into the modern-day Israel, land of Israel, and of course he went into Egypt too. He did great things, but when he started out, he had no idea. He said, God were to say, I want you to go to Mars, and you're going to end up living there, and you're going to do wonderful things. We would be totally lost, moving to an alien land. That's what God wants to each one of us. To go where he tells us to go, to become the person he wants us to become. And as always, the journey is just as important as the destination. The walk with God, a life spent holding God's hand, has great value and great beauty and great strength. Paul has been changed. And it's the Christian call that you and I receive, that Paul's received. Go in faith, and I'll show you step by step. Then a certain Ananias, you now there are three Ananiases in the Bible. Uh, the other one we care about is Ananias and Sapphira, the, uh, the wealthy couple who lied about the property they were given, the money they were given, uh, and fell dead not because of the deceit, not, well, not because of the lack of property, of holding back, but of lying. This Ananias is a, um, Paul says, a devout man according to the law. Probably, almost definitely a Jew. The word Ananias um, means God is gracious. God supplies my needs. It's a good Jewish name. Now, it's possible he was a Gentile and when he was converted to Christianity, took on a, a Jewish name, but with a Jewish name, it's, uh, most scholars would say he was born Jewish, but we don't know. A certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, that means he was also follower of the Mosaic tradition. Having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, all the Jews in Damascus spoke well of Ananias. That's important. We Southern Baptists, uh, when one of our members leaves and goes to another church, that church, if it's the Southern Baptist Church, will ask for a church letter. Now, we don't really think about it anymore. But in the old days, what it really meant was that church would say, we vouch for that man, that person. We say he's a Christian. It meant something back then. To have a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there meant that this is a man who's a Christian, but he's an observant Jew. And this is important, of course, to the, the crowd that's listening to Paul defend himself. Verse 13, he came to me and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. God doesn't need people to perform miracles. But it's a wonderful thing that he does. And every time he uses one of us, what a fantastic honor. And at that same hour, it doesn't mean an hour later, it means at that period of time, I looked up at him. He told me to receive my sight, and I started getting my eyesight back. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you. The 
that you should know His will. Paul has been chosen by God, by God to be an apostle. The word apostle literally means to be sent. God's going to use him. The sad truth is God intends to use everyone. We just think he calls preachers or a few missionaries. Maybe a Sunday school teacher or a deacon. God calls everybody. God has called you to a ministry that will change the world. The devil has managed to trick us into believing the only special people have these calls. And the rest of us should just sit down and shut up. Imagine a church, a universal church, I mean, Every Christian took seriously his call from God, her call from God, in the world. Billy Graham has led hundreds of thousands of people to the Lord. In about 27 days, one person led one person to the Lord, and the two of them led two people to the Lord. And the four of them led eight people to the Lord. In a month, we could evangelize the world. If every Christian led another Christian to the Lord and kept doing it for 30 days, we could save the world. That's what I mean by the fantastic things God has planned that we say no to. The failures of the church universal are our failures to have faith in the God who calls. God is a He respects our opinion. He loves us enough to respect us. And He calls. He doesn't force His will upon us. He calls. Those who answer his call have a part in changing the world. And you will see the just one, you will see Jesus. Remember, to be an eyewitness to Jesus makes Paul officially an apostle. And you will hear the voice of his mouth. Verse 15, for you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now, the Jews didn't get upset about that, but they should have. They're going to get upset when they realize what he meant. But you will be witness, his witness to all men, not just the Jewish world. Verse 16, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. And wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now there are two baptisms in the uh, Jewish and early Christian uh, tradition. We were familiar with the second, the believer's baptism, and certainly this could be part of that too, where we are symbolic, symbolically buried by being laid into the water. It symbolizes that we're being buried. The old, the old person died. And then lifted up out of the water a brand new creature. But it was also part of the ceremonial washing of the temple utensils. Anything you were going to use in the temple for the glory of God, you would wash first. If you think about it, it makes sense. How dare we use built the implements to do God's work. They should be washed first. Paul is being baptized also so that he can be fit to be used by the hand of God. Like a bowl or a cup in the temple, Paul needs to be washed before he's used in God's service. So do you and I. God can use anybody. 
put shame on us for doing service for God in our sins. We should confess our sins and be free from them. Now what happened, verse 17, when I came to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance. We're not sure. This might be the trance he was talking about in 2 Corinthians. Um, we're not sure what the trance was. Verse 18, and I saw Jesus, saw him, the Bible says, saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly they will not receive your testimony concerning me. Paul has to witness and he'd like to witness to the Jews. He's telling them that. But Jesus is telling them they're not going to listen. You're going to have to move elsewhere. Jesus will tell us who to witness to. He will just listen. But it's not always the people who want him. Tell us to witness to Paul wanted to go to every Jew and lead them to Jesus Christ. He desired that. We've seen how often, how normal it was for Paul to go into the synagogue of every new town he entered. He wanted to lead Jews to Jesus. He loved them. And he grew up in a world where it was us and them. Jew and Gentile. And he wants his own people saved. That's normal. For me to want my family to be saved. My loved ones to be saved. You may want to, you may not want to witness to the people God wants you to witness to. He may call you to folks you don't want any part of. Maybe that's another reason he doesn't always tell us the entire picture. If Paul had known he was going to end up leading Gentiles to the Lord, he might have not started his ministry and never completed it. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue, I imprison and beat those who believe on you. Every Jew and every Christian. By that, at that point, most Christians were were Jews, cultural Jews. They all know my reputation. Very few people are going to trust me. Verse twenty. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen, and he's talking to God. When the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death. Paul was too young to be throwing rocks. That was for the men. And guarding the clothes of him who were killing him. It was the tradition to throw off your outer garments because they got in the way so you could throw a stone with all your might and kill the blasphemer or the heretic or someone who had in some way committed an offense, a major offense against the Mosaic Law. These people aren't going to trust me because they, well, as we talked about a few weeks ago, the Christians thought, well, this is just a trick. Paul is pretending to be a Christian so we can get into our circles, learn who we are, and then imprison us or kill us. Then he, Jesus, said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Paul says that in later writings that the, the Jews are grafted off the vine of the people of God and the Gentiles are grafted on. It was a farming term. You take a, a branch from one plant, cut it, and Cut it so that you can match it to the cut you made in the, the other second vine and put the branch from one into another. 
a lot of interesting fruits have been created by doing that. To do that, God had to graft off the Jews. Mainly because of their disbelief. Paul understands that. When he said the words, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. The Jews understood. He was saying, The Jews were out of the equation. The Gentiles were in. The Bible says that at the end of time, Jews will begin to be saved. They will realize that Jesus is the Messiah. But we live in a Gentile, a mainly Gentile period. For the last 2,000 years, it, Christianity has belonged to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. Even though there are groups, there are Messianic Jews, or Jews who believe in Jesus, but there is the exception. Verse 22, when they, the crowd, listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, away with such a one, away with such a fellow, was translated. I mean, the Greek is away, away with such a one from the earth. In other words, kill this guy. For he is not fit to live. How dare a man say, Jew or non-Jew, that Jews don't belong in the kingdom of God. How dare Paul say that just because we deny Jesus, we don't go into God's kingdom. So it is what Paul is saying, and it is right. There is no other way to be saved but by Jesus. Paul has made that claim. Peter makes that claim. Now, there are those today who would try to spread salvation out throughout all throughout all of the religions and say that any sincere person goes to heaven. You can be well intended and sincere but lost if you don't know the way. And there's only one way. And only Jesus Christ is the way. He not just shows us the way He is the way. And if you don't know Jesus, you cannot be saved. There is no other way to be saved but through Jesus Christ. They were offended by that. They've been told from birth, you were born a Jew. You will always be God's people. No matter what you do, no matter what sins you commit, you belong to God. You're His children. They've been warned earlier in the Gospels that God could raise up rocks to follow Him. He didn't need the Jewish people. They needed a little more submission to God's will. A little more humility. But this is not what the way they were raised. They were raised that they were born Jews. They were born by definition, they belong to God. And here's Paul saying, y'all won't listen. So God is sending me, Jesus is sending me to the Gentiles. And they were furious. Verse 23, And as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, now, that was a way of breathing. If you lost a loved one, you would pour, put dust in your hair cover your body in it perhaps, tear your clothes, because that indicated that you were grieving. Someone saw you, he would know to leave you alone, you were grieving. It became a way then later of expressing your grief. They are so angry that they want everyone to know it. So they tore off their clothes, as we saw earlier, when Paul defended the uh, clothes of, of the garments, the, the outer garments of the one stoning um, Stephen. They're throwing off their clothes to get ready to kill Paul. The commander ordered Paul, him, to be brought into the barracks. 
get him out of the way before these people kill him. And that he should be examined under scourging. Probably because the commander didn't speak Hebrew, he didn't understand what, what Paul had just said to get these people so mad. And so he's going to scourge Paul, to torture Paul, to make him confess. So that he might know why they shouted so against him. He's going to torture Paul so that he can know why. Verse 25, and as they bound him with thongs, now that means as they tied him to a, a post. They're going to rip off his clothes, tie him to a post, and they're going to whip him, scourge him. A scourge was a whip usually made out of leather. Sometimes it was hemp rope. And sometimes knots were tied in the end for effect. Sometimes broken glass or nails or sharp rocks were tied to the strands of the whip. So that as you whip that the prisoner across his back, you know, not only make welts, you ripped off chunks of meat. It was incredibly bloody and miserable torture. And as they were tying him to a post with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? By this time, Paul knows the story. He knows the score. That is Roman law that Paul, a citizen cannot be scourged. He can't be tied to a post. It is What they've done is already illegal. And so Paul is in charge of the situation. It doesn't seem that way. He's, the, one crowd wants to kill him. The Romans want to torture him. And Paul just says calmly, is, it, is, it, are you, is this lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? A Roman citizen had to be proven guilty before anything could happen to him. Well, when the centurion heard that, he went to the commander and saying, take care what you do. This man is a Roman. It was completely against the law to scourge a Roman citizen until you first proved his guilt. The centurion is, the centurion is freaking out. He is in danger. He could be executed himself for doing this. The commander came, verse 27, and said to Paul, Tell me, are you a Roman? And Paul said, Yeah. Yeah. You could just you could see the confidence Paul has. One word answer. Yeah. Yes. He knows the Romans are going to freak out. He knows that he's got the upper hand. commander answered, with a large sum, large sum of money, I obtained my citizenship. Paul said, but I was born a citizen. I have never in my life not been a Roman citizen. It was common for um, barbarians in the Roman world to serve in the military. And having worked long enough, raised up enough money, they could buy citizenship. The commander obviously was such a man, born into another country, another culture. And he, with a lot of money, became a Roman citizen. Also, buddy, I got you beat. I was born that way. I was born a Roman citizen. And immediately, I love that. Verse 29, immediately those who were about to examine him, don't you like that word examine? It means torture him, to interrogate him by torture. Those who were about to examine him with truth again. You've already committed a crime by tying a Roman citizen to a post, and you're in danger of the death penalty yourself. You kind of want to just slip into the woodwork. Go hide somewhere. 
And that's what they all did. Those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. They just left. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman because he had bound him. His, he didn't do it personally, but he ordered him. God may send you into a dangerous situation, but you are in the hand of God. You're in the hands of God. And nothing's going to happen to you unless God allows it. But we're told in the Bible what a wonderful thing it is to suffer like Jesus, to suffer with Jesus. And God may certainly call you to suffer. He may call you with a calling that is fatal. You know, fatal works in different ways. Sometimes we think about going into dangerous situations and getting killed. But God may call you to give up the life you want and spend the next 60 years in another life. Now I can tell you from my experience, that's the greatest gift in the world. I, re I resent nothing about my call. Not even the failures or the attacks. I'm very pleased with the calling God gave me. Maybe that's another reason God doesn't tell us what He's got in mind for us. Because the satisfaction trust in God and seeing how wonderfully it works out it can't be explained it, only, it has to be experienced Paul was with two groups of people one that wanted to kill him by beating him to death or by throwing rocks, large rocks at him until they battered his skull in the other side wants the time to oppose him and rip meat off his body with a whip not like our whip with one strand but a whip with traditionally nine again nails broken glass sharp rocks and he's in charge he's got everything under his control because God has it under his control Paul was never in danger. I think it explains why later on Paul is so cocky. And you've seen God do what he wants to do. While you're standing in the midst of powerful groups, angry, hateful groups, you realize the only way you're going to die is if God decides to use your death. And even then, praise God, that I get to die like Jesus did. Verse 30. Let's finish our Bible study. The next day, because he, the commander, wanted to know for certain why he, Paul, was accused by the Jews. Okay, he still needs to keep the peace. And for some reason, the Jews are all right up and want to kill him. He can't torture Paul like he wanted to, because Paul's a Roman citizen. But he still needs to know what's going on. Remember, the Romans didn't much care how the foreign nations lived, just as long as they paid their taxes and didn't cause trouble. Well, that held true for the military as well. They better make sure the taxes get paid, and they better make sure there's no trouble. This commander who bought his citizenship with a large sum of money could be in major trouble if he can't keep The Romans would traditionally send him to a, a nastier, less important area, and Israel was not a very important area anyway. So to go downhill from here is pretty unappealing. That, that's how they handled failure. They demoted him. So he needs to keep the peace. So he gets Paul and said he released Paul from his bonds and commanded 
chief priests and all their council to appear. So the chief priests and the Sanhedrin and Paul is standing there unbound in all his glory with Jewish leaders who have been ordered to show up. And yes, when the Romans order you, it's come or else. And he brought Paul down and set him before them. So we're about to continue. Paul's life is changing. He's been doing fantastic missionary work. And it's easy to wonder why didn't God let him just keep doing it? He's led so many to the Lord. He's got so many churches. But we have to trust God knows what he's doing. I will remind you that the bulk of the churches that Paul has established were good, thriving, strong churches are in modern day Turkey. And most of them are no more. Muslim attacks ended their their vitality. Now, some of those churches are still existing, but with a great burden upon them. Paul's done wonderful work, but now it's time for him to go to Rome. That's where this is headed. Paul is about, while he chains, set in motion the growth of our church in such a way as to make Christianity worldwide. Sometimes we're failures. We're simply God closing the door to where you've been working, no matter how successful you've been. Because He now realizes it's time for you to move to next stage. It might be bigger and better. It might be smaller but more profound. Sometimes subtle changes are more important than big splashes. God knows. We have to trust in Him. That's the lesson I get from this. That God knows what He's doing. And we see it in his treatment of all. But at the beginning, remember, I told you, what God was putting Paul through is what we all go through. The call for blind faith. Blind because we don't know where we're heading. Now, it's not going to stay blind. God is going to illuminate the way. But only step by step. Paul has no idea he's going to Rome. He has no idea that he is going to be one of the major religious leaders, not just of Christianity, but of the world. The greatest, Paul is one of the greatest influences, religious influences in the history of the world. He doesn't know what he's about. All he knows is that he's been a very successful church planter. And maybe he more than he do. You don't know what God's got in mind. But I promise you it's big. It may be big and subtle. You may never see in this lifetime what God's going to do. Room. But it's glorious. If only we would obey. I'm reminded of the, um, the nightmare from the uh, prayer of Jabez, where the preacher who wrote, the, wrote that, that famous Bible study said he, in a dream, went to heaven. And as he was being taken on a tour of heaven, he saw a giant warehouse. And he asked him, what's the story? And he was told, you don't want to know. Well, he persisted, so they let him go in. When he walked into the warehouse, he saw this 
small boxes and giant crates just all over the, the warehouse was packed with different sized boxes. He asked, what does this mean? And he was told, these are all the gifts God wanted to give you in your life. But you refused them. Now that is a nightmare. To turn down the blessings of God through apathy, or fear, or sin. I think about my family and not being able to love them, but missing out on loving them. What a tragedy that would be. There are people who ignore their loved ones. And when the children grow up, they're strangers. We don't dare neglect the gifts that God wants to give us. And He only gives, those, gives us those gifts as we follow him step by step in faith. He wants to take us to glorious things. He wants to take you to glorious things. You have to take a step today and be willing tomorrow to take the next step. And so forth and so on. This Bible study is a blessing to me. And I hope it has been for you. As always, in Christ's service and in yours, I am your pastor.